Okay, so we put a flat surface on with the belt sander, and after the first pass, that's also the time to look at your core carefully to make sure it's still oriented with the vertical plumbing, right? um, so it's properly in there. Ours were, but if it, if it weren't, you could uh, soak the core at that time, dissolve the glue, and then remount it again and start the procedure again. Okay, so we're okay. So now we're gonna move um, by hand, and we're just gonna, again, step down to successively finer sand grids. Gonna start with 220, 320, 400, and then we're actually gonna go into um, micro papers, so uh, 30 micron, 15 micron, and nine micron, and then a little bit of lamb's wool at the end to give a, a nice final polish to it. So we don't wanna use um, just our fingers on there because our fingers are an irregular surface, and we wanna maintain that nice flat surface when we're looking at it through a microscope. So everything's the same distance from the lens. So I just got a little block of wood. I'm just gonna wrap the uh, sandpaper in here and then just begin sanding. And the idea then is that each successive um, paper is taking out the striations from the previous coarser grain. So you can kind of, again, if you change the direction that you're sanding, you can kind of be sure when you've removed the previous sandpaper's striation. So it just takes a few minutes, step down. By the time you get down to the finest grade, uh, you're really just giving it a few passes with each one. So we're done sanding. Um, as you're sanding, you can kind of tap the core to get the uh, sawdust out of the uh, the pores or have a little brush, toothbrush or any kind of brush can kind of get that off. And you want to be able to see those pores under the microscope, helps you identify the rings. So we have three different types of wood here. We have uh, the pine, which was a very easy to see the rings here. Um, uh, pines or uh, conifers or non-porous wood and under the microscope you'll, you'll see that can't pick out the pores quite so readily with these. Um, you see the light color, that's what's the early, early wood. So that's the wood that the tree was putting on early in the growing season. And then the dark wood is the late wood as it starts preparing for before winter, okay? The cells get denser as it um, begins to go dormant. Actually see some examples of uh, false rings. I don't know if you can see them here, but under the microscope, uh, kind of gradually started getting darker and then it came out again, whether it was breaking a drought uh, in the growing season, kind of slowed down, then came out again, or perhaps a frost early on kind of knocked it back and then it began growing again. Um, it wasn't, wasn't a sharp boundary though, so that's how I identify it as a, as a false ring. But we'll, we'll make sure, we'll, we'll do cross dating and, and make sure we are assigning the right years. The other type of woods we have just quickly, here are our oaks. Right. Oaks are an example of um, ring porous. Right. So uh, you have larger pores in the early wood and then you kind of lose them as it goes into the late wood. So you see the fat pores in the early wood and, and then the uh, late wood has um, finer pores. That's what helps you define the ring under the microscope. And beech here, our last one, is an example of uh, ring, I'm sorry, porous, diffuse pores. I'll get it. Um, and probably from where you're looking, you're not gonna be able to see that really well, but here the pores are kind of uh, diffused throughout the ring, and it can be quite difficult at times to, uh, to find out exactly where that ring boundary is, and that's why a, a really fine sanding job is really critical for uh, identifying the annual rings on these. So that's very important. Okay. So in order to do um, cross dating, what that involves is assigning a calendar year to each ring. Um, if all trees in the same area had the same exact pattern, it would be very easy, but they don't. There's some variation. Um, you know, the pine was growing on a pretty shallow soil, rocky site, so it's probably feeling a different environment some of these other cores, other trees were. But nevertheless, there will be consistent patterns. Uh, a particular drought year, a drier year, is going to show up as a thinner year on all the different rings. And so we're going to look for those marker years. Um, ideally, we would have 10 or 20 cores, and we would um, cross-date them all and look for those marker years, look for the ones that are very distinctive, usually a thin ring. And um, say 1954 was a dry year, 
you want to make sure that each of your cores shows a thin year for 1954, an annual ring, thin annual ring in 1954. If you get a real thin ring in 1953, your uh, suspicion is that you miscounted somewhere and you'd go back and check that again. So the uh, ring on the outside, right next to the bark, that was this past year's growth. So we cored in the autumn, so the tree was already done growing. So that'll be our current year. And then we're just going to count back under the microscope to help me see here. And I'll make marks in pencil at first, and then later, if need be, we can make them permanent. But we want to be able to erase them uh, until we're sure about them. And I'm just going to count back. And every decade year, I'll put a single dot. Right? So 1990, 1980, 1970, I'll put a dot right on the ring for that particular year. If it's a half century, so 1950 or 1850, I'll put a double dot. If it's a century, like 1900, I'll put three dots for that. And if it's a millennium year, like the year 2000, I'll put four dots. So the first time, I'm just going through, putting the dots on. And what I'm confident with it, then I'll go back and write on the edge of the, um, the mount, 90, 80, 70, 60, so that as I'm looking at it under the microscope later and I see the dot, I see what year it is right there. Okay, so we've, we've done cross-dating. Right? We've assigned uh, individual calendar years to each ring on the core. And some interesting things show up. You can kind of see, I hope, um, the years walk, walking down there, so 2000, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50. Here's 1950, and if you notice, there's that thin ring at 1954 I was talking about, so it was a, a drought year around here, uh, 40. And then if you look in the 1930s, we see some thin rings. Obviously, that was the Dust Bowl year, times of dry conditions in many parts in the world. And then there's a, you also notice that there's periods of relatively fat rings, or what we call uh, release, so there was good growth going on there. But if we keep working back, this is a relatively old tree. So if we're back into the early 1900s, 18, uh, late 1800s, see this tree wasn't happy <laughs> very much, very, a lot of thin rings, so this tree was suppressed. Right? So we call these suppression rings, uh, indicating very small growth or not much growth. So the tree was experiencing stress and then and you can see why we would call that release when it d did grow bigger. Perhaps its neighbor fell over and it shot up into the canopy. So by analyzing um, the, the, the ring widths, um, you get uh, start to understand the, the ecology of this particular tree. And if we have many different cores from um, different parts in the stand, you're able to recreate what forest dynamics were like, what, what is making that forest the way it is, uh, what's affecting one tree, and then also what's affecting many of the trees. And we can use that pattern of uh, cross-dating, right, the pattern of thin rings, uh, thick rings, um, to extend back in, in time. So older trees, we, it, if they overlap, we can extend them back, or trees that have, been, um, have died but are preserved, or even wood that's in old log cabins. Uh, we can kind of extend the chronology back and are able to recreate climate patterns uh, going back uh, hundreds of years. And so we'll end with an example of recreating drought conditions in the United States based on um, tree rings, Palmer Drought Severity Index. <laughs>